Mr. Carmichael. Morning, Jerry. Good morning. How are you doing, buddy? Okay. It is dark these mornings, is it not? It is. Uh, it, just a touch of light. I believe we passed Coming home directly across the top of the hills. I believe we passed past the crest of this hill or the depths of this valley in four days. Oh. That sounds good. I always. I always prefer the time of year where the days are getting longer. Yeah. We have passed the point where the sun is not setting any later, but it is rising later. Hmm. Interesting little thing about the solstice where it, the sun um, hits a point where it stops setting later and continues to rise later. So mm -hmm. it sort of compresses from the morning because I always think of it, I always thought of it as, you know, the sun setting later and later, but mm -hmm. it doesn't work that way. Mm -hmm. And that's because the sun is now dipping over and under the flat horizon of the flat earth like faster right exactly exactly <laughs> yeah. and it's and it's working the epicycles differently than mars would for example well the 5g has completely thrown a a, a spin into everything so you know. and now with the vaccine there's going to be longer days that's what i hear yeah <laughs> yeah that's good i'm glad we got this call off to the right start <laughs> <laughs> Scott, hi Klaus. Morning, Dave. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Hey, gang. Yeah, well, I mean, one of the things that's really in the back of my head a lot, a lot, a lot these days, and I had a, I had a strange thought yesterday about it, is how do we, how do we deal with half the country being completely on uh, a dangerous tangent? Um, and, and I think I can confidently say that that is a dangerous tangent and that other realities are more real and more useful and not dangerous. So I think that was a, that's an easy one. And the thought I had yesterday was, how do we hack evangelical pastors? Because a big part of the problem is that somehow uh, evangelism has become a carrier of these memes and there are pastors who are preaching hard uh, for the, right now, the overthrow of the government, like the illegitimate, et cetera, et cetera. Like, like I, I care less about 5G and anti-vaxxing. Well, the vaccine thing suddenly became, <laughs> so the vaccine thing suddenly became from, ooh, measles, measles might get bad to, oh, we might never get back to normal, right? Um, Doug, go ahead. Uh, I would like to challenge the idea that half the country is going in a crazy direction. Half is high for me. I wouldn't say half, but I would say a quarter. It, it, it might be worse in the sense that the Democrat, the Democrats as the professional class were running the economy off the cliff anyway <laughs> with a kind of neoliberal uh, approach that concentrates wealth and all that. So that the, the stupid half of the country is really just reacting to what the smart half of the country did because the smart half of the country was running us into real trouble. Um, and I, I, I did a series of videos about Trump and what to do about Trump uh, and so forth. And in them, I say Trump is smarter than most people think he is. And a lot of uh, Trump supporters are not misogynist, racist, homophobic assholes. They in fact are rejecting the status quo, um, as you just said, and then not in the videos because Biden was not yet the president elect, not in the videos is a thought that I have in my brain, which I'll share right now which is if Biden doesn't fix the things that are underlying and actually broken, if he is a, if he is a return to the status quo ante, which is the Obama-Biden administrations, we could very likely have backlash and have uh, you know, Ivanka as president in 2024. So I'm, I'm deeply concerned that we don't do enough. No, that's a big discussion in the, uh, at the Sierra Club and in this forum where you have you know, the Sunrise Movement and a whole bunch of other groups participating. And, so their idea, they're so disappointed about the appointment of the, uh, the cabinet for, for um, agriculture. It's basically the who same is agriculture? guy. Um, God, it's, the same, it's the same guy who was under Obama for eight oh, years. Oh, right, right. Yeah. 
and so of course he he is uh, you know he's, he comes from the industrial food system you know he is all in favor of uh, you know fertilizers and all the chemicals and so on and the, so 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 the the impetus is to fight you know fight against the nomination fight against this candidate and so on and i'm i'm working really hard to 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 change that message into um let's say what we are concerned about you know let's make a statement that one sixth of the american children grow up food insecure and are stunted in their in their growth and development for a lifetime now let's talk about mil tens of millions of people living in food deserts let's be specific you know and and i think this is really the moment we have to be specific uh in in naming the things that are that are wrong you know? So, and before we go into our check-in check round, um, I lived in Barcelona for like nine months years ago. I was in Barcelona when 9-11 happened. And one of the things that happened one day was I was walking through one of the main squares and there was an older couple and they were both very tiny and they both had bow legs. And they represented malnourish malnutrition that had happened in Spain because Spain had the triple bad luck of getting Franco in 33 or something like that having the Spanish Civil War sort of sitting out the, civil, the, 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 the World War II and then having Franco for another 30 years or more. Uh, and, and that led to really, really um, twisted sorts of things. And the younger generation of Spaniards are like tall strapping people who, who were like, you know, growing way taller than their parents and grandparents. Uh, and then second thought, which is um, on the forum, which I'm finally getting well acquainted with, better acquainted with, Rob asked a really good question, which is, hey, building a regenerative food system is too broad for a quest. It doesn't have a time bound. And so it feels to me like maybe, and, and, and I'm, I'm now thinking of one that might be too short, but um, could we have a quest to get a better secretary of agriculture? And could that quest require us or motivate us to connect with Sunrise Movement, uh, Thunberg's organization, a bunch of younger organizations and a bunch of other people to figure out what are the narratives, what are the multiple things needed to cause that shift? Because I, I agree with what you just reported in as the disappointment of, of these movements for the appointment of the status quo, because that's clearly the status quo coming back in. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I would. I mean, I, I'm inclined to assume good intentions until mm -hmm. otherwise. You know, because okay. if we start out assuming bad intentions or bad intents, then we're, then we're in a fighting mode and we're, we're, we're continuing the same mess. Then, then maybe the quest is framed not as removal and replacement of an official, but as some kind of proof that the kind of movement we would like to see actually exists in the new administration. Yes. And if not, then the stimulation of that movement to replace the old script. Yeah. I, I think the positive messaging of the needs is, is the compelling story. To, to depoliticize as much as possible and just make this a primary focus of constructive action mm -hmm. and put it forward to whomever's in the box. And if they don't respond, then you have all sorts of options of how you, how you proceed. But beginning with good intent. Well, and, you'd be really good at figuring out how to frame the most explicit and yet not decades of paper long <laughs> um, position paper on something like that to get us started. I like that. Um, where, should we, uh, where we could pick a forum thread and start sort of framing this up, but I, I, I'm, I'm in the process right now of describing some quests and getting us questing and, and having quests be a thing we know how to do. Uh, I'm gonna post a, um, a, a video uh, that I did for the steering committee. Uh, some of you have watched it. It's just me with the post-its that are behind me right there. That was a great post-it video, Jerry. I liked this it a lot. Is, this is old school Miro. Um, and I, I basically tried to describe what happens to quests and projects and roles and all of that. And since then, we've talked about a couple other roles that we need, uh, like connectors and like uh, facilitators for forums and stuff like that. So those should be roles that people can find out about as well. Scott, sorry, you've been patient. Oh, that, that's fine. I, I think I'm still, it, it relates, I think I'm back with your comment about hijacking evangelicals and I'm expanding evangelical out to mean who 
is being listened to with intent, with, with unquestioned loyalty, with, with real impact on people's thinking. And how do you get into their heads? Because they already have the audience. And I, I just think that that's, it, it was a comment that you made that we haven't, I think deserves, like try, instead of trying to get your own audience, who's got the audience? And how do you influence them? It just seems like a high leverage activity that we could play in. Um, an example, I've heard some people who have been getting Republicans and Democrats together into small rooms, I mean leaders, and having those conversations and letting them work it out in a non-public forum, you know, and, and how do you get into those rooms uh, yeah. or into those minds that already have audiences? Um, briefly before I go to Ken, um, so there's a whole bunch of thoughts in my brain about how kind of Gingrich, uh, a, a lot of the current division in American Congress and other and society go back to Gingrich's revolution in 94, when he basically made sure that no Republican would have a meal, exercise, or share a, a flat in DC with a Democrat. He basically broke all of the places and ways that they had moments to actually sit down and hear what each other thought and maybe make compromises or anything like that. Then, and anybody who broke with message was not going to get funding for their primary. And because of gerrymandering and the Tea Party and all those things, um, there, no Republican was afraid of the general election. They were all afraid of the primaries and they needed that money for the primaries. So, th so the right has been extremely good at maintaining message discipline, as you can see with how few of them, McConnell being a notable exception, like you know, two days ago when he actually said, you know, presidents like Biden, we need to now do this. But still, still the vast majority of Republicans are, are on message with the far right. And so th there's that. And there's, there's five other threads that, that you just provoked, which to me are part of the thing to try to work with toward. And Judy, you're right. I think positive framing and figuring out how this works is, is a good way to go. My problem is I know too much, I know too much about how the sausage got made and it's my own story about how the sausage got made. But I always feel like if you understand how that got made, you have a better chance to undo it. But that I may be wrong about that because, you know, uh, they say positive action uh, helps more. Ken. Well, to go back to um, your original statement that Doug challenged you on about half the country being on a dangerous track. Uh, there's a linguist by the name of uh, Benjamin Worf, and um, he, he's the first person I ever encountered who used the term unsane, as opposed to, he said, there's three kinds of people, there's sane, insane, and unsane. And the unsane are people who, they're, they're not stupid, um, you know, they are easily led. These are, these are the kind of people that the evangelicals are reaching. So if we think of them not as insane, not as, not as bad, not as evil, but as easily led and rather um, superstitious, then what, how do we design conversations and invite them into those conversations for learning as opposed to trying to change their minds, right? It's like they're very malleable under the right circumstances, but they're also very defended because they have an identity that um, we need to make sure we're not threatening that identity. So that's just a little thought that flashed through my mind. Love that, Klaus and John. Yeah, my my, my uh, suggestion would be to just change the topic. You know, the, the, this this conversation is so rammed into the ground, and they are, the, the positions are so frozen in place. And and I keep saying, food is the ideal way to do that because uh, it it communicates on such a broad uh, palette. You know, you can talk about uh, your personal health, your resilience against uh, disease, and you can talk about climate change uh, in, in, in very stark ways because there's clarity in science now that you can't fix climate change without fixing the food system. You know, this, this, uh, I mean, it's, uh, the United Nations is focusing their summit on, on food systems uh, uh, design uh, for 2021. The, the, uh, no, the entire conversation is focused on food. So by, by, by chiming into this and making this a story, you know, if you divert the attention away from all this conflict and uh, mm -hmm. debates you know, and put it into something that has practical application in everybody's lives, everybody eats food. Um, and to make things worse, the sort of a darker angle on that, a lot of people are in food distress right now, way many more than were before the pandemic started. 
and December 26th, a lot of the support goes away unless Congress manages to pass something. Uh, at the end of the year, a lot of the um, rent abatement or non-eviction laws go away. So we're about to see this crisis get a bunch worse. Um, so, so the moment for helping on food is is now. Like this really, this really works now. Go ahead, John. Hi. Uh, yeah, I would support the idea of of shifting the subject slightly, and this may be redundant. I came in late, but because late we're not into this group because I know Doug and others and, and and you, Jerry, have talked about the sort of tribal affiliation as dominating these other kind of content issue concerns. So what that would suggest is if you're going to open the dialogue, quote unquote, the dialogue with somebody on the other side, where you want to go first is where are you getting support or, or what support do you need? Or, you know, something along those lines of I'm getting, <clears throat> I get support this way. You know, is that a kind of support that you find helpful? And it's a, it's a totally, it's a tack. It's, it's deliberately going 90 degrees off the issue, but that's the whole point, is that, that that support, if they're getting it, or that lack of support, if they're not, is what's deeply at the core of the stress and what we might code as unsane behavior. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if there, a, Jerry, you probably have a link on this, but there was a great interview with an ex Ex Nazi. Mm -hmm. Okay. This is a young, you probably know this one, right? This, it's a young white nationalist. And he did, he was an outlier. He did belong to a gang. He was looking for, you know, something like that. He had no opinions about Jews. He had no opinions about a whole lot of things. And he acquired all those opinions in order to be part of this group. And then when he finally caught on, you know, What's going on? About five years later, he got himself out, and then now he now he's reflecting on how did that happen? Where did I get all those views? So anyhow, that's that's available. It's probably in your brain somewhere, right? So I'm going to show you a thought right now because I've I've got a small collection, so I don't know which of these you might be talking about. Uh, and there are I think there are many many stories like this. Yeah, yeah. That, That's mm -hmm. that's the thought that I have in my brain, and it's connected to documentaries like White Right uh, and yeah. a bunch of other things. So it's sure. maybe one of those. Hey, Kevin. Um, so, so I would love to frame up, given where we've just gone, uh, a positively tilted, um, kind of urgently motivated mission to figure out what OGM can do about that issue uh, and, and turn that into a quest. And let's see who's interested in joining it. And the quest can have its own set of calls and, and get some, you know, try to get some action items. And, and I'm, I'm very interested in quests having um, a lot of freedom of how to go about trying to do what they're trying to do, right? Uh, maybe, maybe the answer is to stimulate a meme of throwing food, very tiny food festivals, right? So a decade, a decade ago, there was a very tiny meme that went around for, um, what were they called? Seed bombing. And people would take some dirt and some seeds and make up a little hand grenade and they'd chuck it into an empty lot and flowers would spring up, right? And then there's been a little meme of urban farming and people converting empty lots as cities got devastated and lots went unused into actually food producing lots. And that's really interesting. And maybe maybe there's a way now to create um, just shared food festivals where you do socially distance, you, do, you, do, you secure food sharing. So people show up and start eating with you. Know, with, with you. And that's that's. There's nothing like breaking bread to open a conversation and to say, okay, what? How do you normally get food or something like that? Go ahead, Doug. Okay. Uh, what's interesting to me in this conversation is how do we maintain a kind of backroom conversation about what we really believe and what we think is going on in the context of a lot of quests that already have a platform, so to speak, and a, and a goal and a way of working. So it's, it's like uh, how to have a think tank in the background as a resource to all the quests. Do you mean how to keep separate dark thoughts about things from a quest that should be framed positively or do you mean something different? Well, at the moment, given the conversation, what I'm thinking is that uh, part of the political problem in the US is that the, the Trump supporters believe 
that things like science are ripoff paths to high paid careers that, su that support uh, the kids of the 10% or the 1% uh, going to college and getting on in life uh, that the rest of the country is paying for. And it's so unfair, they're not going to participate in reasonable conversations about things like welfare and food. So it's that kind of conversation uh, that I think is really important to have somewhere within the open global mind context that's different than it's being a quest. Um, I, will, I will try to integrate that because uh, because the waterfront on issues here is, is broad and um, complicated. And so we, need, we want to frame something up that, that um, has a, a, a point to it, that has a, a focus that that's sort of feels doable to it. Um, and, and again, the moment is, is like ripe right now for, for 15 different reasons. Go ahead, Klaus. Yeah, but, but, but what my experience has been since I started working with NGOs in about eight years ago now, um, there are so many efforts out there and they're all good, but they're not coordinated and they lose their impact because they're shooting into all kinds of directions. Uh, I mean, it's literally like herding cats. You know? and so if, if that power can be bundled somewhat, you know, and guided, uh, uh, not it, it just, just guided into one general direction, it could have so much more impact. Um, so you just gave me a funny idea. Uh, maybe we need to have a guild named Cat Shepherds. Uh, and, and I say that only half tongue in cheek because one of the things I'm hope, I've, I've hoped to do personally way before OGM and that I'm hoping OGM can do is this notion I call outreach or bridging or connecting to other groups and doing a DNA exchange and being helpful to them and all of that, but also helping them connect with each other without losing their individual identities. It's, it's not that we all have to be, I, I, I think, it's not that we all have to become one movement and then that one movement has so many people that it's overwhelming. It's that these movements need to coordinate and use their resources well so that all these problems can get fixed in all the different ways that are happening. And I don't know that it's OGM's role to have the best solution to all these things. I think it's our role to help articulate and to help connect. It's, uh, you know, uh, Marc Antoine loves, you know, uh, OGM connects the connectors uh, as a description of what we do. And I, I, I think there's a, a, a lot of truth in that. Um, it's, sorry, there's a lot of wishful truth in that because I don't think we're doing much of that yet, but, but it feels like the, the cat herding and outreach and connecting role could be huge here because as you say, Carl, there's a whole bunch of high functioning groups that aren't getting traction because they're not, they're not, it's not that they're not connected, they're not unified. Go ahead, Ken. Well, along with the cat shepherding, I was just was thinking, you know, I read this book years ago and I occasionally reread it called um, Stalking the Wild Pendulum <clears throat> on the Mechanics mm -hmm. of Consciousness by Itzhak Bentov. And he has these wonderful little drawings of the difference between incandescent light and laser light. So incandescent light, he has all these little soldiers marching in different directions. And he says for laser light, they all march in the same direction. So um, that made me think of um, laser pointing for, for cat shepherding of how to um, get all these cats to focus on that laser so we can get them moving in the same direction. So what can we use as a laser pointer for our cats? And lasers work through collimation, which is basically the alignment of the light um, so that they're sort of in harmony, which creates the power of laser. Um, yeah, Kevin, in, go ahead. Know, I was in an interesting conversation this week. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, what was with the, uh, uh, the lead for uh, innovations, the global leader for in innovations at Xerox. So, so the, you know, the interview was directed at him to talk about what are they working on, you know, what's coming out in this crazy time of change. And I inserted questions of, are you focusing on workforce issues like income, you know, employment, training, and so on? Wasn't even on his radar. I told him not on his radar. Then I asked, uh, are you aware of uh, issues in agriculture, the innovations that when you're talking all about energy, are you aware of agriculture? Zero, no understanding, no knowledge. Even even the group that interviewed him had no no real awareness. You know? oh. so, so 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 people who live in these corporations, I had never heard of a food desert, and I was working all my life in the food business. 
That's amazing. After I retired, you know. And so, I mean, my my my, my whole point now is here. I was I was uh, in a in a strategic position, making decisions in the food system, right? Building, you know, the big food systems. And I had no idea about nutrition, the impact of what we eat on agriculture and so on. So there is a need to communicate you know, in, in non-threatening ways, uh, in, an edu in educational ways. We assume these people know, they don't. They sit in these offices, make decisions, and they don't have a systems perspective of the impact of their decisions. And the stories are really fun. Like the stories of how this works and who figured it out and what happens to people who do go through it are like totally fun and, and, and easy to tell and, and they're, they're viral. They're, um, I, one could call them, if one had a really big imagination, retellable stories. I'm just saying. Um, Kevin, you wanted to jump in. Yeah, on bridging, uh, you know, my principal bridge group uh, is this group left leaning in you know, which is the poor county in Mississippi, where my family's from. And, uh, the, you know, it's both sort of uh, Itawamba expats and people who are still living there. And the people who are still living there are starting to talk like I hear a lot of black folks talk about how they're so tired and worn down, you know, when white folks want to know, uh, tell me what black experience is like or whatever. And, and they're, they're, they're feeling more afraid of violence and they're, they're just feeling worn down as you know, they are, a, in, in a sense, a persecuted minority who can't speak its name. You know, they, they're signaling to each other. Now, they in the Walmart, they realize, oh, you're, you're one of them. You know, there's this little, little, kind of like a, a, the Jerry's group used to be when I would go to the tech conferences. It's like, oh, I could be human with these people. I didn't have to do my tech shit, you know. <clears throat> but it's being worn down. And, and the, the, the concept of, of reaching out seems much less viable to all of them now. They feel much more embattled. And the folks who think the vaccine is a plot also thought the election was a plot. And, and I think, you know, the, uh, these are folks who are actually living around the folks you want to reach out to. And they're, they're, they're retrenching and, and, and feeling like they need to be bunkered. And this group gives them a place. But they're, they're, there's just much more, more fear in the Trump areas now because uh, Violence is, is, is rippling out in ways that they haven't seen before. Yeah, yeah. Um, Doug, and then let's go to our check-in round. Yeah, I, I'm gonna say, uh, can you hear me? Am I unmuted? Yeah, yes, I fine. am. Uh, that a lot of these Trump supporters have a background of uh, having lost out from the factory system when the factories closed down. But if you go back a generation before that, they were farmers who lost out. Uh, and there was a very vigorous farm movement in the late 1800s uh, with the, uh, Brian and the Cross of Gold and all that sort of stuff that these people have in their background as an unconscious view of what's happening politically. Uh, and I think it's really important to see that they're not that stupid. Uh, when we think of the stupid people working in the factories, they were immigrant Pol uh, from immigrants from places like Poland where they had been farmers and nobody built on that scale. So I wanna say that I think the Trump supporters have hidden resources that they're holding back because they don't see any way to participate where it would be them who might have the jobs in a, in a better system. Love that. I love that framing. And uh, I, I think it was Gatto in one of his books that basically says, look, at the Civil War, 80% of Americans are farming. And between the Civil War and World War I, there's this gigantic shift into factories, gigantic shift into factories. And it, that number goes down to 20%. Like, that is not a long period of time, 1964 to 1914, or 1864 to 1914. Uh, that's a, that's a, a very compressed moment. And it tears up a whole bunch of societies, tears up a bunch of cities, and then manufacturing works until it doesn't. And then manufacturing's sort of uh, kind of the, maybe the overblown death of manufacturing is really, really bad for all these people. Um, but finding viable ways in. Okay, Klaus, last, last word on this and then we'll- Yeah, so, so the, the, the cycle that is happening now, we went from agriculture into factories, right? So now we're going out of factories into nowhere. 
so currently there are uh, an estimated 10 million jobs that got eliminated this year, they're gone. And there is no one even thinking about where are these people going to go? And the, the thing now with artificial intelligence is they're replacing white collar jobs. They're replacing higher paying jobs. You know, because bank, I mean, in the insurance company, banking, finance, they're all shedding jobs uh, because automation can, can uh, you know, do it better, faster. So that is a real dilemma that is also impacting you know, the, the political tensions in the country. I completely agree. And I've got a couple speeches I can point to on Prezi where I, where I basically say in the middle of the speech, we are heading into the great unemployment. Uh, and a lot of this is going to be automation unemployment and, no, and nobody's paying attention to that. Um, and a second thing showed up in my head, which is I just talked about the trend away from uh, agriculture. And, we, and then you said that all these manufacturing jobs are gone and so forth. Um, can't we think of the production of food as manufacturing of food? Isn't farming a form of manuf and like if we went back to the land and figured out how to make food everywhere, aren't those sort of manufacturing jobs? Well, the, the vision that that uh, many of us have in the in the, uh, the food reformation uh, uh, movement there is a decentralized system where you have local food production, but then also local processing, because much of the waste in the system comes from having a factory sitting someplace and then from all over the country and overseas come in the tomatoes you now to make this tomato sauce where the the remember um future shock um the the uh the, the book that came out i think in the 70s or 80s Alvin Toffler and Heidi Toffler exactly and he hit his the, the one thing that that uh, stuck with me was uh the high tech high touch and what, what he was arguing then is that the advance in, in technology allows a miniaturization of factory processes, you know, that allow you to decentralize the entire system. So you can have food, very highly efficient food factories in a community that takes all the stuff off the field, you know, that, that, would, that now goes to waste and processes it, it cans it, pickles it, salts it, and so on. So there is absolutely... I think that the first thing we want to make sure is that people have food sovereignty, you know, just to take the pressure off and, and, and allow people to call their own food, process it, and, and, and uh, preserve it. Uh, Doug, will you jump again? Go ahead. Yeah, I think it's not, we don't want to go to a, a, an industrial agricultural system. I think we want to go more uh, to a craft food system. I'm agreeing with that. I'm just saying there's a way of calling it manufacturing that, uh, that, that, that might appeal. I had a question about, if, let's see, Klaus just brought up something, those figures that you posted about the move away from agriculture. Yeah. How much of a role did introducing mechanical devices into farming play a role in eliminating jobs? So. Um, yeah, I, I, and, and there's a whole bunch of things that tumble out of out of that conversation. Um, let's do a check-in round. Pete, welcome back. Um, so let's go Kevin, Judy, John. Uh, you're still muted, Kevin. Yeah, sorry. <clears throat> I didn't come. Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, things are going well. Our community equity, friends and family funding is finding people who want to either give to it or give and invest to it. And <clears throat> and we're looking to license it, uh, get it done today to Chicago. There's this interesting uh, system gap in an emergent system. There's a whole lot of different new cooperatives and there's new funds to fund cooperatives with revenue share so you don't need an exit. And uh, then there's two or three uh, emerging, doing pretty well, uh, cooperative conglomerates, you know, sort of Mondragon at, at a modest scale. There's one here that Rockefeller and other folks have funded and, and there's one in, in Boston. And, um, and there's some, uh, some accelerators and stuff. And there's a need for a, uh, an observer analyst because nobody's making sense of how the funds are different to tell them apart and, and how they're, and, and the same thing with the platforms and the conglomerates. And so 
Now, that's a role I've done before when I'm here. I don't care about this, but this is a piece of information infrastructure that the market is calling out for. So I'm going to write a blog about it. <clears throat> and what I'm looking for, if, if you guys know of it, <clears throat> any young MBA or student who's a pattern recognizer sense maker with a quant side. Uh, to, th there is a role here. Somebody could build a little consultancy kind of thing or something. <clears throat> and it's, you know, it's it, it, the biggest, there's enough happening that there, there is a role for a newsletter analyst kind of thing that you can, which is needed to build and make sense of this market as it grows. And so if you guys know anybody who's in that role, I'm going to write a blog to, to say this is the job description of and I'm looking for somebody and <clears throat> I would just help advise it. So anyway. Um, post that to the list when you're done with it and we'll, yeah. we'll at least yeah. take the tree because um, I like that idea a whole bunch. Post it to the forum. Yeah. Yeah, or somewhere. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, you know, markets form at, at in predictable ways. And, and this is a thing where there's enough innovation in enough different forms that it needs somebody wandering, you know, a beat, a beat reporter with an analyst running. So, yeah. Oh, cool. Uh, Judy, John, Pete. I like the idea that, that we're starting to focus on some quests a lot. Um, I'm still framing values with groups here in town around shared vision and trying to get to some shared vision so we can move to the quest phase. So sorry, shared vision on which part can you? Oh, I'm, I'm not working the agricultural angle right now in town. I'm working the educational perspective, mm -hmm. and sort of shifting from education to learning and including social consciousness and those topics and I'm working with a couple different groups uh, in terms of including that in our shared vision so that we can then become actionable. Perfect, thank you. And I think there's clearly an educational quest in here. And I think part of this conversation and part of Rob's question in the forum leads me to say for quests, how do we get more specific so that we have a sort of a time bounded objective that fits our, our overall MO and goals uh, for quests, and I think that we should shape one up around uh, around learning as well. That would be that would be terrific. Um, so let's think about that. Uh, John, Pete, Julian. Hello. So uh, I go back quite a ways with a few of you, but I'm at the same time relatively new to this group. And I mean, I I. I get, okay, quest, yeah, okay, yeah. <laughs> see what we're doing here. But I don't, I, I haven't figured out this, this, this structure yet that you're uh, evolving. And so I'm just getting familiar with it. I'm kind of um, un uncharacteristically, optimistically underemployed <laughs> at the present. I am working on a, on a novel called The Kennedys in Purgatory, which um, imagines that you could bring John and Robert Kennedy back and show them what's going on and have and and do that experientially actually take them disguise them and take them to certain settings and um <laughs> i actually have kennedy he now looks like a kennedy but he doesn't look like robert kennedy and he plays he role plays a, a, an errant relative of his who is a criminal but he goes to the same place and he starts doing charitable work he, he does outreach to to natives and the idea is that and, and he is in a wheelchair which makes him look like the guy who's also in a wheelchair and the idea is that you kind of like create these weird examples where the person who's fucking up has to deny that he did the good thing you know or else say well wait a minute did i do that you know and i'm playing around with that kind of moral uh ambiguity and moral uh modeling so um, it, it's definitely engaging, but I think I should be doing something else, <laughs> perhaps it, joining the education effort here because I got a lot of uh, background in education and learning or, or one of these other uh, quests. I'm looking forward to doing that as well. Uh, thanks, John. And I posted a video at the top of the chat, it might have been before you joined, uh, that I just did with the post-its behind me that tries to explain what is, what is a quest, what are the roles here, what commons are we touching, how do those things kind of interact? That will give you a, a little bit more uh, information about it. Okay, um, sounds good. That sounds awesome. And uh, so Pete, Julian, Jay. 
Uh, it's good morning, everybody. Um, it's good to see everybody. Uh, I feel like uh, things are percolating along pretty well, kind of in in infrastructure land of uh, OGM. Uh, so uh, it's great to see Jerry's um, uh, post-it note video. Uh, that was really cool. And uh, we're getting some some kind of internal structure with Free Jerry's Brain and with the uh, forum facilitation uh, team. Um, and kind of working through, you know, how to how to support OGM better, um, I guess. Uh, so that feels really cool. good. Um, maybe that's good enough for now. And by way of checking, just connecting to what Picha said, we're also uh, we're we're marshaling some of our resources to be a platform resource for Lionsburg, which is Jordan Suklut's. Uh, effort to build uh, sh steward ownership organizations. So um, hopefully we, we should we need to sort of click that <laughs> and, and get back to him. But uh, I think that could be super interesting as well. Uh, Julian J. Lauren. Uh, good morning. Uh, see, there was a, a good time with the Free Jerry's Brain Call on Monday. It actually went for an hour after its scheduled time. Uh, we talked about a lot of aspects of dealing with networks. And uh, since then, I've started to actually try to implement some of the ideas, but mostly it seems like my SIGGRAPH work has taken up the week because they're trying to get all their meetings done by the end of the year. So it's been a few meetings, a few different aspects of SIGGRAPH meet, uh, meeting every day. So Thank you. And in, in um, Monday's Free Jerry's Brain Call, Julian demoed uh, some of his SIGGRAPH visualizations, which led to a really uh, fruitful conversation back and forth because uh, a couple of us are like, ah, 3D, such the third dimension adds so much complexity and so much richness at the same time. How do you pull that apart? What do you do? So it was really cool. Yeah, at some point, I hope we can get to where we, where I can demo the, the real 3D, because as I said in the call, and I say repeatedly, we're not looking at 3D graphics, and we haven't been for the last 50 years. It's 2D, and what we need is 3D display systems, but it's you can't do it over Zoom. Yeah. Um, and and I was hypothesizing that a 3D version, like a walk-in, a virtuality version of Zoom, might be called Zroom. Anyway, uh, Jay, Lauren, then Scott. Oh, why not Whoosh? There could be that, or some Where other onomatopoeic thing. Um, yeah, I uh, had a great call with the uh, Storyflow, Chico Lab crew on Monday and um, you know part of the topic which is kind of convergent topic which is in this deep profile territory the territory I've been exploring for a long time which is how do our stories as people add up to a story and how do our stories as a collective add up to a story or a collection of stories and so it was, it was ripe and it, it got me thinking and I kind of, I dropped into uh, another framework uh, to layer. I've been playing around with this for a long time on top of the journey curve. I've been wanting to do like hieroglyphics, kind of sim kind of practicing symbology uh, that represents stories so we don't get so hung up in the words. So I delivered one of those to um, a client uh, this week, which is basically using the journey curve to layer on kind of iconic elements of um, in, in tapped inside of your legend uh, to represent kind of bigger stories. So um, I'm excited about that because I think it's something that can reference both collective stories as well as individual stories. Love that, thanks Jay. Um, Lauren, it looks like you're on a quest to find the lost ark. <laughs> Yeah, I'm um, in the forest again. Awesome. Ah, uh, yeah. So um, we are super excited about uh, Jerry's uh, video that he dropped uh, this week, last week, uh, about other roles and quests and everything like that. And we just want to run with it. And so um, one thing we would like to do on, on Mondays is to host a call we do a circle appreciation and we're gonna invite everyone from uh, OGM uh, to come. And it's just, be, it's a really simple procedure where we just uh, say what we appreciate about each other. And 
um, use those little snippets. I'm going to turn those into mini videos. And I'd like to use those to actually fill out uh, Jerry's conception of the, the map to try to place people into roles that we think they'd be good at. And um, yeah, so I'd love to combine those two and um, figure out how, how we can uh, kind of jump in there and just to experiment and do stuff with it. So I think that's it. And Thanks yeah, so. it was a great session last Monday with Jay. It was amazing. Yeah. Yay, awesome. Um, Scott Klaus Ken. Okay, um, something related to Jay. So that's, this is something I'm very interested in is how to create higher living. So there, there we are, there's every problem. You're on one side, you have to get to the other side. There's a challenge in the middle. Oh, there's another way to look at it. Okay, so you have a goal. How do you avoid distraction and stay on target? Again, these are understandable by anyone at any level. And so I believe that these are fundamental. And, and one of my key themes throughout all these calls is how do we take these ideas and make them easier to understand? not harder to understand because obviously we all can take it and make it more complicated because you all understand the nuance and the complexity of it all, the wicked problem that's out there. So what I wanna share this week, I'll paste this in the chat. Um, this is something that I've been working on since I started talking with you all. Um, it's actually the summary of about 25 years of just kind of playing around with thinking. And my goal is to make these thinking skills a stack of interconnected bits that are teachable to young people or anyone really. And I finally uh, have gotten a conceptual framework for it. I'm very, very excited about this. So I'm gonna paste it in the chat then I'm gonna say it out loud. So it's in three big buckets, conceptual, practical, and personal, purposeful. Um, the conceptual side is learn, which is essentially systems thinking and mental models at a very simple level uh, based on the Cabrera research, their distinction systems, relationships, and perspectives model, because I find it easy to teach to anyone. Building on that, you then, so now that you understand how to take a problem apart and how to, how to look at things, practical, okay, so we're gonna make something. That's the reason to do these things is that we're gonna have some kind of action. Well, what are the, the tools of that? We have visual and verbal, we have divergent and convergent, and we have internal and distributed. So all of our tools that we use to, to capture thinking outside of our head. And then in the last group, we have you know, the purposeful side, which is games, stories, the future. It's how we integrate all of this into a vision of something bigger. And one of the things I was focusing on as I was making my notes, um, which strangely enough, look like this kind of mess. <laughs> That's where this all comes from. Um, I said, I wanna make this, if possible, single syllable, or at least cat in the hat words. Um, and that was uh, at the bottom, I had learn, make, pictures, words, try, decide, inside, outside, play, game, story, and you. And I thought, if I can use those words as my anchors, I can make this accessible to anyone. And that's where I have ended up. That sounds just awesome. And I'm, I'd I'm waiting to sort of immerse myself in what you've built. And there's a whole series of threads that you just woke up. One of them is, you know, is text a temporary hack? What does post literacy mean? <clears throat> what happened? What is our next mode of communication? Can we find simple symbols that help us illustrate and communicate at a very high level? That like that, that sounds really, really animating. And then a, a tiny side thing, which is um, 
So the story I heard, Pete, uh, and this is from a John Taylor Gatto article, is that there was a, a type of learning of reading called whole word reading, which was a, a complete screw up. And basically they didn't teach alphabet and phonetics. They just had people start to say, oh, that's cat. And like, just recognize whole words. And that um, Seuss was challenged and funded to create books that had extremely limited vocabulary for children in order to promote whole word reading. And that that was kind of the frame within which he started writing that, you know, uh, green eggs and ham, et cetera, you know, name your, name your Seuss book. And they're all about limited vocabulary and telling a funny story with, you know, with great illustrations, but limited words. Um, so there's kind of a, a bit of a twisty, twisty narrative there. And uh, again, I didn't go way deep down the rabbit hole to figure out you know, whether that was right or not, but, but I do trust Gatto on, on a lot of this research. Um, yeah. So uh, where are we? Sorry, uh, forgot what, who was on my queue. Klaus, then me. Yeah, Klaus, Ken, and then uh, Trey. Yeah, so last week we uh, ended up talking about uh, tools and PowerPoint versus all the other creative tools out there. And, and we sort of ditched on the PowerPoint and it really uh, made me think about it because I'm a PowerPoint kind of guy, right? I'm thinking, what am I like totally obsolete or uh, behind the, the eight ball here? And <clears throat> so it put me on, on a uh, journey thinking back about when I worked at Disney, you know, in the embedded in the Imagineering team. And Disney, I mean, is like one of the most creative companies in the world, right? I mean, and they, they perfected the process of creativity from ideation to operational uh, execution uh, in a way that, that's just incredible. Um, and they did this, well, 50 years ago when Walt Disney was still alive and uh, when they were using uh, the kind of storytelling or ideation uh, uh, for movies and then for theme parks and then for anything, hotels, uh, restaurants and so on. Um, and there, there is a very defined process. So the first thing you learn when you join the Imagineering team is how, how do we work? How does the process unfold? And it starts with what they call blue sky ideation, which is, and all the tools that, that we have seen, that I've seen the teams using so far are basically uh, automating what Disney has done for the last 50 years. Uh, and, and they just use more manual processes, now it's in a computer. But uh, the, 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 the way of you know, kicking up ideas and playing with it and so on, but then there comes a point where you have to turn this into a concept. So there, there is a, a concept and then in this concept comes a feasibility check. So there is a first level feasibility and that then engages finance, uh, it engages engineering uh, and it engages the operator. So, so when that concept check, if that, if that idea passes the feasibility check, then it goes into concept design. By the time it goes into concept design, you're now dealing with people who don't know what was being discussed in the creative process. So you have to, you have to bring everybody along the storyline and now the process becomes like completely linear because you have to start with, here, here is the foundation of the story. Here's how we have developed this and here's what it's, where it's supposed to go. Uh, so, Linear then becomes PowerPoint. So even a company like, like Disney, PowerPoint rules. You know? um, and the creative process is actually really in the Imagineering team and in, in people who, who are you now paid to just think out of the box, so to speak. So that repositioned me to, yeah, you're okay with your PowerPoint story. <laughs> Oops, uh, thank you, Klaus. I appreciate that very much. Um, let's go, Ken, Trey, Doug. Hello, everybody. Um, I was one of the lucky people on that call on Monday with Lauren and uh, Jay and Judy and Charles. And uh, it was really, it was just an excellent way to spend uh, a couple hours in the afternoon there. Um, I, 
there's a group of consultants here in the Bay Area um, that were meeting quite regularly until the lockdown came. And we were looking at a number of different things. Not we, There was some parallels to OGM. Um, a bunch of folks who were systems thinkers, Peter David Stroh and Marilyn Paul, his wife, and you know they live in Berkeley and they have this big house and they're like, we want to convene people to get stuff done. And we stopped uh, meeting after after March. And I called my friend Bob Horn on Thanksgiving. Bob's a visual synthesizer, and you know he said, "What are you thinking about?" And I, you know, told him a few things. He said, well, I'm thinking about how we're going to get the country talking to each other because we got half the country, as Jerry was saying, you know, thinking that the election was stolen, and that's not going to go away. And you know, you're the conversation guy. How are we going to get this going? I said, "Well, let's start small. Let's let's get our group back together." So I've requested to um, hold a Zoom meeting. And I'm a little peeved because they're kind of dragging their feet. They're like, yeah, we love the idea. Let's do it on these dates. And they didn't send an invitation out and it's not happening. But um, I am trying to stir up some interest uh, among these folks to say, you know, let's sit down and reconnect and and let's, let's really put some thought into how do we talk to um, the other, however we perceive the other to be, because I think it's really important that um, we start to do this. And I'm thinking of Jay is the only person that I have heard in the last few months who said he actually watches Fox News so he can get a perspective of what the other side is hearing. And, you know, it wouldn't be a bad idea for many of my progressive friends to spend a little time on Fox News and, you know, to like, you don't have to agree with it. Just get to know what's out there, you know. Um, we need to, I think, lower this bar of judgment um, which is just so rampant. And I, I find it a total turnoff, you know? It's like, I don't wanna be sitting in judgment of people. I, I want to find ways to connect um, and have conversations without trying to change anybody's mind. I'm thinking of the Public Conversations Project, which started after this horrible event in Brookline, Massachusetts, which occurred, I was working two blocks away when this happened. A man walked into an abortion clinic and killed a bunch of people. And, um, Public Conversations Project was, the idea was to bring together pro-life and pro-choice people in conversation. And they spent an entire year with the leaders of both movements meeting behind closed doors, very secretive meetings. And all they did was unpack trigger words so that, um, you know, the minute you said one word, the other side was like, well, oh, that's it, I'm out of here, you know. And I think we need, to do, I need to, we need to slow it down enough to actually do that, to say, what are the words that really trigger you? And let's make a list of that so that we can get to know these are words that when they're entered into the conversation, create lots of distress for people. So let's make sure that we now know what they are and we cannot use those and find other ways to have our conversations. I think that'd be a really excellent first step. Uh, so anyway, that's kind of what I'm thinking about these days. Thanks, Ken. Uh, Jay, go ahead. I just want to thank you, Ken. I just want to add like a sad moment for me. I've been really disciplined about trying to keep people on my Facebook feed um, if they have very different views. Really, it's like my yoga. And um, I just, on Sunday, it was like one just smacked so far to the right. And I, I got locked down in a trying to like keep human about it and ended up taking up all my Sunday morning and Ari's looking at me like, my wife's looking at me like, what are you doing right now? And I just, I just, I was like, you're right. And I just deleted my comments and I, and I unfriended him. And it made me so sad, not just because um, of the individual act, but like, it's almost like the platform itself wants us to be divided. And I mean, I mean, I think that's almost obvious now, but um, but what is the thing that doesn't want us to be divided? What, what is the platform that enables um, to, to be able to see each other as actual humans that we can, where we can find that, that place of connection? I think Facebook is a terrible venue for, for having conversations with anybody who has different opinions. It's just fractures really quickly. I think face-to-face -face or other platforms are much more useful than Facebook. Um, yes although I'm not sure which other ones I would point to. And, and I will say that we, uh, we've had in the OGM community, several people who have debate platforms and you know, other kinds of argumentation platforms and other sorts of things that are really interesting. Um, I think I reported long ago that um, I'm friends with a guy named Rome Viharo, I think Vitaro, who has a, a really deep sort of journey, uh, 
a really deep argumentation the theory that is not code, is not instantiated in, in any kind of practical platform yet, um, that I barely understand uh, that where he's gone down this rabbit hole really pretty far, trying to figure out how to, how to make credible, how to reward people for changing their minds a bit in this kind of setting. So I think there's a whole, there's a whole series of things we could explore there. And I, my, well, my rhetorical question is, what if Facebook had been founded as a platform for citizens instead of consumers? Because what it is, is a, is a platform to trap data from consumers, sell it off to marketers, who then pitch it to consumers. And the way that that works is there's a reward cycle for spinning up active conversations that are very often dysfunctional. So, so what would they have done different? The, the positive question that's, in, that's buried in there is, what would they have done differently if they had been designing for citizens? Right? Um, so let's go Trey, uh, Doug, then me. So I'm currently sitting in awe of the synchronicities of the universe at this very, 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 very moment. Um, because I have not been able to come onto OGM calls um, for a variety of reasons. And I got off of a previous call and I noticed that this one was happening and I knew that I was going to be dropping in 45 minutes late, but there was just something that said, get on the freaking call. And here I am. And I'm, <laughs> I just finished hearing Scott and just, and hearing Ken. And I'm just like, oh, this is, this is crazy how the world, how synchronicity works. So I have just finished getting off of a call with Ben Roberts of the now what community. And we have just finished having a call around setting up an experiment, just beginning the conversations like nothing designed yet, specifically around finding common ground between polarized individuals. And, and in particular, when you're talking about platforms, and this is new to me, so I don't know a whole lot about it, but Ben is a beta tester for the voice voice platform from Maestro Conference. And that we really want to just sort of play with voice voice and learn voice voice and learn what what it's because it's all about micro conversations and then micro conversations rippling out and something that can be replicated where you don't have to have a facilitator. And I was just like, this is too fun. <laughs> this is just too fun that I just happened to be dropping in on this. I'm just, I'm, I'm just like, Oh my God, this is hilarious. Um, so I'm just really feeling, um, I'm just feeling connected in this moment and grateful. And, um, and I, I really love being in awe and wonder of, of the collective consciousness that's emerging. And, um, and I just really want to say yay. And, and, and Ken, if, I mean, I'm sure you have your networks and I don't know you, but if you don't know Ben or you want to connect, I, I just think that there's an opportunity here that everybody's sort of playing with the ideas. And I would really like to, nobody's, we already decided that nobody's really going to be doing any meeting now until January. But I mean, I could, I could definitely make those, those connections and, and the, the community in now what is now getting ready to plan what their six week collective in the spring is going to look like and and what the theme is going to be and how we're going to you know and and so maybe there's something there and so i mean i'm just i'm my my i'm i've got these like little sparks going off in my head and in my heart and going i don't know what i don't know but i <laughs> but there's something here and so i just wanted to uh to offer that up and say i'm so glad i jumped on the call Thank you. I do know Ben. I know Ben pretty well, actually. Okay, well, ben, I would say give him a call. <laughs> ben, is a, ben is a black belt in these topics. And a couple people who've been in OGM in particular early were I met through uh, the next now, the now what conversations. Um, so I, I just um, ran out of time to participate in a lot of them. But um, but they're doing a really, really good job of exploring these issues. Thank you, Trey. That's That's like really good synchronicity. We love the good synchronicity. Um, Doug, then me. Well, 
I find myself thinking that words like conversation, minds, words themselves are markers of our tribe, this little group here. It's the kind of people we are. But we're dealing with people for whom those are not the markers. Their markers are things like, I got a truck, you got a truck. I've got a t-shirt. I've got a kid who's dyslexic. I don't have a job. They're different markers for different tribes. And if we try and pull, think that we can pull them into our tribe, we're making a mistake. Uh, I like to think of what it would be like to hire people from the rural right or wherever we think that is to actually do the jobs of making things better. That is, if they had jobs, we have leverage on them. If they don't have jobs to do this work, we don't have leverage. Conversation is not going to do it. Okay, end of first point. Second point, I keep thinking of OGM and the absence of what feels to me like scenario thinking. Uh, uh, where are we? How did we get here? What can happen? What then should we do? Um, I think there are two plausible futures. Now that's always a dangerous way to start of dividing things up so neatly. But one is decentralization and the other is centralization. I think that where we are, there's gonna be a big push in society towards centralized solutions, using all the technologies we have, the finance, uh, the state organizations, and so on. Uh, I think that effort's going to fail. Uh, it's too authoritarian, and it doesn't know how to deal with a lot of the issues. But we're going to be living in a period, I don't know how long, a decade, of push towards high-tech high centralized solutions using what we have because people are gonna feel like the challenge of staying under two degrees requires centralization. Um, the problem with centralization as I see it, the key problem is the link to finance. Centralization and high tech are ways of focusing uh, uh, wealth, not of distributing it. And if we don't solve that problem, the high-tech scenario will fail. I think it's gonna fail for a lot of reasons anyway, like it won't have enough energy to maintain the infrastructure. So that's gonna to lead to decentralization. But that gets interesting because decentralization is in the context of a failure, not in the context of let's fix it. It's fixing it and dealing with failure are different approaches. Anyway, those are my thoughts. Thank you. That was uh, three brainfuls right there. Um, uh, and there are many tools like scenario planning, and we could, in fact, do a we we could try doing some scenario planning on on these kinds of things. Um, Jerry, can I just come in and say a word about scenario planning? The please. way I'm thinking of scenario planning generally is going from the present towards the future. It's like the runner at the block waiting for the gun. I've thought for a long time that much better is sitting on a surfboard, watching a wave come, let it go, watching another, getting a sense for how things emerge and how they follow on. Scenario planning has missed dealing with the past. Wait, what was the last sentence you said? Scenario planning has missed? Does, does not incorporate uh, looking seriously at the past that got us here. It's all for right. action going forward. I, I just posted something different. on the demise of the nation state that po points out Doug's problem really well. I, I really like that guy who wrote it. Uh, go ahead, Klaus. Yeah, this, I mean, coming to the scenario planning, what I was just saying is to go from blue sky ideation to operational execution requires a step in the middle, right? It's a translation required. So, so my job was basically to translate the creative intent into operational fulfillment and reality. So, so that we have to separate those two. Uh, so we have to separate uh, the scenario planning with scenario execution. These are, mm -hmm. It's a critical step in the middle um, when the process becomes very linear. That was my point. Um, I think there's a 
a conversation to be had here about methods for backcasting, forecasting, planning, et cetera, and how they fit OGM uh, methods and <clears throat> something like that. I think there's a there's a, a rich load here, and how do we and how do we instrument some of these things so that they're way easily available to people who need to do some planning but aren't planning wonks. For example, that could be a, an, an interesting thing to try to do. Go ahead, Kevin. Well, Judy was Judy. Uh, Judy was ahead of me. I'll go after her. Judy, then Jen. I was just going to say that my experience with scenario work is that you can do it at multiple levels, and in my opinion, it's it works best if you start with can we agree on where we are, and what are the dimensions or scenarios that fit with where we are, how did we get here, and then given those two what do we see as possibilities for the future and then framing toward preferred ones? Uh, Kevin, then Jay. Yeah, you know, in terms of uh, incorporating the past in your innovation in the future, one of the most interesting uh, social enterprises I dealt with over the last while was a team that sent a, uh, an anthropologist and technologist to the field. And they had a really interesting uh, uh, easy way to test anemia in India. <clears throat> and they were discovering that people weren't doing it. And then the anthropologist realized that higher caste people would not touch the finger insert after lower caste people. So they instituted a false uh, 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 purification of the instrument. So you would not be touching after the caste because of this embedded history that the people wouldn't innovate around. And so by, you know, honoring a, a fundamental injustice they got people tested for anemia so it was just uh, realizing the past is a barrier that's uh, quite brilliant there's lovely stories about sending anthropologists in to uh, for bali and xerox in bali it's the book perfect order where it turns out that the green revolution almost killed off not only farming in bali but also the reefs offshore because they introduced fertilizers and modern farming and all that. And there were algal blooms that were like choking the reefs. And it turned out that the thousand year old Hindu rituals that distributed that, that were, were done from the top water temple all the way down through the subaks, which are the different little water districts on the side of the mountain, that the, that the rituals incorporated an optimization algorithm for who should get how much water off the mountain and whose field should lie fallow this season because you needed, a, you needed a barrier of fallow fields that were flooded in order to stop pests from crossing. And all of that had been broken by scientists trying to come in and fix things. And then the, the, the Xerox story is that uh, Xerox spent some money in the early days of expert systems and AI to build an expert system for repairing copiers. And copiers are uh, analog digital devices that live in damp basements and all, all that kind of stuff. So they have very, very complicated breakdown loads. And it turned out that when they sent an anthropologist in, the anthropologist said, let's put an open walkie talkie next to all the repair technicians. And everybody's busy listening to other people's narratives. And that this is where communities of practice thinking uh, was sort of invented and coined, is that legitimate peripheral participation means you're listening in on your buddies fixing copiers. And you're like, oh, yeah, yeah, I had one just like that. And it turned out that the toner was getting too hot because it, they were putting it down next to the, the, the radiator or whatever. I'm making that up entirely. But, but it turned out that storytelling was a better way to fix copiers than an expert system of that, of that era. Um, and so I'm a medium fan of, of a scenario planning because as an employee of Esther Dyson's back in the 90s, Esther was part of the Global Business Network. So I started getting involved, to, invited to GBN things and they did a lot of shell-based scenario planning because some of the inventors of scenario planning were the founders of GBN. So I've seen a whole bunch of it. And part of me really likes it and part of me like saw good ideas just die in the middle of the process because as soon as you pick two axes for the scenario you were muting a whole bunch of other interesting conversations about it and I'll also point out that John Kelly in this call has more depth in this topic than than me by 10x and probably than most of us so if you want to throw in your your thoughts on this I, I'd appreciate that as well John. Just a quick one um Yes, the, the GBN method or the shell method is a method. It, it, it tended to dominate scenario thinking. It's not definitely not the only method. There's, there's a several other methods. Uh, we might characterize them as, you know, bottom up as opposed to top down. Uh, we developed a different method uh, at the company I was with. Um, with it was worked upward from the event. GBN created events after they got the big scenarios. We created the events first, bubbled them up, cracked, 
you know, arranged them in patterns, uh, did a lot of pattern recognition stuff. You know, more on that if anybody wants to know. I'll just mention in terms of the, the value of scenarios, even when they're quote unquote wrong, <laughs> there's, there's some good ones. There's some surprisingly good ones uh, developed by the Center for Long-Term Cybersecurity. And here's the key, they didn't develop them. They sponsored the acquisition of opinion from a lot of different people. And a lot of this work was anchored in about 2017, 2018. So there's, a, there's some funny tilts in there. There's no COVID at all, there's, you know, but it was 20, 2018 looking at 2025. One of their wonderful scenarios that I think OGM should read, it's, I think it's a scenario two, it's called the death of wiggle room. And what it says is because of advances in, in uh, surveillance capitalism, because of advances in artificial intelligence, because of all these advances, we know too much. Even if we're a little bit wrong, we know way too much about what people are doing. And that removes the wiggle room, which is what's the underlying thing that was getting everything to work. You know, was the fact that, you know, you, people would meet and they would say, well, this is not of the budget or, you know, and, they, and then they would adjust in their personal relationships. And as soon as you take that away, you know, <laughs> horrible things happen, including they had a very interesting strategy that um, basically people got very aggressive about creating multiple artificial uh, digital personas because that was that that was the. That was the bottom-up response to, oh, you're going to know that much about me? Well, then there's going to be multiple me's, and you're just going to have to deal with it, and we're going to, we're going to very aggressively uh, develop and defend those because that's we got to have wiggle room. They tried to hack the system to build wiggle yeah, room. Right, that's super cool. right. and, and the more we try to automate everything, the more we enter that world where we have lots of sensors, lots of information. We try to automate the thing, and we, we eliminate all the, the, the places where there's slack or whatever other word you want to use uh, right. for that. That's like a negotiation. Yeah. Cool, thank you. Um, and we're down to our last 15 minutes. So uh, I would love to do a bit of wrap uh, along the uh, Kiko Lab, et cetera, kind of, uh, of thing and just say, where, where have we been in this call? Uh, what was this call like? Are you going to do your own check-in? Oh, yeah. There was that. Um, so I'm excited about a lot of things that I put in during the call. I'm excited about the video with the, po the, with the post-its. I'm excited about progress on framing up quests. Um, but also I have, I have sort of a new slice of brain and energy uh, for OGM because my mom passed uh, on uh, December 5th. And I spent uh, yesterday, uh, basically the middle of the day, uh, so the, uh, Tuesday, the, uh, the middle of, of Tuesday, um, collecting my mom's effects from the assisted living facility uh, where she was. And that meant sort of sorting through the last of her things, seeing a lot of things from my life again, packing them up, putting them in storage here, uh, a bunch of other things like that. And it was, um, it was sad, it was sobering. Um, they let me into the facility in full PPE. So they, that's the only, you know, uh, otherwise, I would not have been able to even go in. And they, for other people, what they're basically doing is they pack things up and hand you boxes, and then good luck to you. You have to go and unpack and, and do whatever. But, but I also got to see a lot of the caregivers who who knew mom and loved her, and things like that. And that was it was lovely. Um, so I'm trying to write a kind of a biography of mom, and I'm really struggling with um, the difficult aspects of life with mom and the good aspects and how to balance that in, in a bio that sort of honors her life in different ways. So I'm, I'm a little stuck on that, but, but I'm also trying to figure out um, how to do storytelling with more artifacts, how to enrich this um, anyway. And, and so that's one, one piece. And then a separate thing that's floating in my head that I just, I, I wanna figure out from you all, um, if this has energy. So a April is uh, um, in the final stretches of her first book. And she had, yesterday she had an author day, which was awesome. And basically she had meetings with her publishers, Barrett Kaler, which is an off the charts, a small house, but off the charts, brilliant and different. And I love them. Uh, and they had, you know, all day long she had meetings with them. And in the middle, she gave a talk, basically her author talk and 87 people were in the Zoom. So it was quite cool. Um, 
and all of which to that's fabulous all of which to say like i had a book disaster in the year 2000 and i have part of my problem is i speak in brain connectedness and, and linearizing things into a book always feels like i'm losing a lot but i also realize that books make really good souvenirs and my my problem also is i, I haven't gone back into book production because i can't see an outline that i love but i was thinking uh, maybe there's a sub project in OGM uh, around some of the ideas and I, I could st just start sort of start putting ideas and maps out there and see what book or books emerge from it from our collaborations. Like how does that fit together and how do, how do, how do they get expressed in various media in different ways. So, um, so I'm trying to figure out, uh, thanks Scott. And I remember reading Speaker for the Dead long ago so I've got to go reload that into my brain. Um, into this one, the wet one, um, but trying to figure out how might we tell multiple stories together that are in, interwoven in a transmedia kind of way, uh, in a way that that isn't is that that produces a couple books along the way, but as byproducts of interactions, conversations, etc., where the book souvenir has links back to all of the artifacts that are actually in the world, in really interesting ways. So, so I'm, I'm interested in, in, in exploring the medium through this too many plots and too many connected things and, and the 450,000 things in my brain kind of thing. Like, like to me, there's, there's an interesting artifact in the middle there to produce or multiple artifacts that represent this weaving of stories. Um, I'm not explaining it very well, but I'm trying to figure out um, is, that a, is that a reasonable use of some OGM resources? Would people like to, to, to see that happen or join in? Um, and if so, what do you think about it? Sounds like a great idea. Good use of, of OGM resources and good use of OGM um, community brain, I think. Um, I just, I would love the idea to uh, be in conversation. Uh, there's that word again, sorry, Doug. <laughs> uh, to be in conversation around the creation of, of you know, uh, a book um, that multiple people would contribute to. I, I think an OGM book would be really amazing. I think it would be really lovely to do it in a collection mode, not a book mm -hmm. that flows, but a collection of insights uh, and there'd be a lot, a lot of different ways you could envision that if you put together a table of contents, because you could take the insights from individuals and then sort to categories, or you could personify the book with Ken's chapter, Klaus's chapter, and so on. So, and sorry, I think ahead, either would be appealing. I was going to throw in the chat, one of my favorite books of all time is Dog Hammarskjöld's Markings. Um, he just kept a journal of his thoughts and they were brief, but at the end they were all published. And each one is a nugget of wisdom or insight that I think is a really strong book. So if you haven't read it, I'd suggest it. What's the title again, Judy? Markings. Markings, thank you. I've not read it, I'm not, it, it's not even in my brain. Dog is, but not the book. Um, my, I think I mentioned on one or two OGM calls earlier that uh, Kenneth Tyler and I played with his wiki to turn a wiki into a web blog and PowerPoint killer. And uh, so to me, a book is kind of a table of contents. And if each thing being pointed to each chapter in the table of contents is a nugget that exists online, then saying, hey, make a book out of these nuggets and put this front matter and this back matter you know, around it, and then turn that into an ebook could then, and if there was a rich world of nuggets that were independent enough that they could flow together, then I could print a book or publish an ebook that has this sequence of seven nuggets. And then Pete could publish a book that has the first two are his, and then one of mine, and then one of Klaus's. And then we could collectively publish some other sort of string or a series that takes the same front and back and then replaces the middle industry by industry that sounds really juicy and interesting and exciting. And as a collective, we could then create a, you know, a whole series of books, all of which have the hashtag, you know, OGM books or OGM something or other. Um, that would be lovely. I would, I would be thrilled um, to be part of that enterprise. That sounds great. 
Um, and then we could all basically riff on these things together and, and come toward, you know, and, and in the act of publishing books, uh, we then also connect the books to the conversations. The first paragraph of whatever book I ever publish, I, I, the first paragraph of the introduction was going to say, thank you for buying this souvenir. You have just bought a, a snapshot in time of a, and a serialization of a whole bunch of thinking, which is more interesting and op available for free online over here. But but this but this is a is a is an interesting you know snapshot. So Ken and Julian, and then let's go to the wrap again, which I just totally broke by introducing a completely new idea. Sorry, Ken and Julian. So the late great Jay Cross had a um, really mm. wonderful way of he he actually gave me his hardcover book and the book uh, it was not it was a softcover book, but the the book basically was the invitation to the online platform. So I think there's a nice synergy there of creating something that you can hold in your hand and flip through and get ideas. And then you say, oh, I want to know more about that. And boom, you go to the IGM you know, forum or whatever we've set up for that. And you go really in, in depth and there's you know, edited videos from our calls and, and interviews. And so it could, it could turn into something that would be a real living document. Um, you know, and Jay updated every couple of years. You know, it's like what what you have here is just a snapshot in time, and in two years it's going to be different. And so, you know, I I think that'd be a really awesome way to um, uh, grow this thing. Thank you for bringing up Jay in that context. I really that's perfect. Thank you, Julian. Uh, you're muted. But the view is great where you are. California State Parks. <laughs> Uh, I think that one is Anza Borrego. So. Nice. So, so th this is great to hear because I'm completely with you about the idea that uh, it's many things just can't not be presented serially. If you think of John Muir's comment about how everything in the universe is connected to everything else, and in fact, this was the basis for all this work in history I've been doing is that stuff is, you can point at something, but when you really look at it, it's connected to all these other things, which in turn are connected to all these other things. So for some years now, I've been working with the idea, you know, people keep bugging me to write a book about all this tech work I'm doing. And one of the reasons I haven't done it is because I don't view books as being, well, the way we do books now is anachronisms of what we've had to do. And now with modern tech, we can say that there's all this stuff here. And what you call a book is actually a way of navigating through that stuff. And you might navigate through it a different way tomorrow. As just as Ken was saying, how in two years it'll be different. Well, it might even just be two hours. So it's uh, this idea you have of saying, you know, well, a few thoughts from Ken, a few thoughts from Scott, and, and then when Scott does it, it's going to be a few thoughts from Pete and maybe a few thoughts from Doug. So yeah, this is completely in line with the idea that what we're calling a book is really a set of stuff and you find a way of navigating through it. And one of the things I want to emphasize is that the stuff doesn't necessarily have to be text. Because again, with modern tech, stuff could be 3D animations. It could be Trello boards. It could be symbols from Scott's vocabulary. Yes. Yes, absolutely. So uh, stop thinking about just books being made only of text. Rather, there are more mini experiences. It's like, here's one little bit. Uh, Scott spent a minute drawing one of these diagrams and then that experience goes there because it's not just the diagram, there's also some commentary about it. And that's probably gonna be audio. So whatever the stuff is, we can put it in this big set and navigate it, navigate through it. Scott, I have a brief story about Xanadu and then we'll go to the wrap. Um, one of the, so I was a tech industry trends analyst for a dozen years. One of the first companies I visited was Xanadu in, in East, in, not in East Palo Alto, in the old Palo Alto on California Avenue. Uh, in a, all of that stuff has changed now. But I interviewed Roger Gregory, who to this day is the geekiest geek I ever met. He like looked like the, the stereotype of the geek. And I wrote an article that basically said Project Xanadu is, is going to have something in the marketplace in a couple, in two years. Uh, imagine my surprise 15 years later to read somebody else's article about Project Xanadu that concluded that they were going to have something in the market in two years. Um, so they're the, like, in term, I think they're still alive, like somehow, I don't know how, they must have gotten a good endowment or something. They are? Okay. Yes, they are. In fact, I've had some frequent discussions with Ted Nelson. So. Excellent. Um, but, but it's just like this interminable project that, that doesn't seem to, to, to land, but, it, but, but it's meaningful in, in, the, in the geeky world. <clears throat> so let's wrap. What, how, what was this call like? What did we do? Um, 
let's just do a recap. Kevin. Yeah, I think uh, Doug's point that uh, inviting Trumpers into a nuanced conversation would be an extremely threatening experience for them, and but the kind of delusion that the people on this call, including me, would would think is a great idea. To which I will answer, I think, at least my energies are, how do we serve other people with functionally useful stuff to them in their world, not how do we drag them into this place to have our conversation. So, so I'm at least on board with what Doug was saying, um, even if I may just want people to come in here and have lovely chats on Thursdays. Uh, and one other thing, Rebecca Solnit's three books on cities are an amazing thing. They're, they're big. <clears throat> and there's a book of San Francisco, New York, and New Orleans. And it's different histories of different neighborhoods in different times. And it's, it's just, it's a fabulous book, but it's, it's anchored by a place. Also, Roman Mars' new book of 99% Invisible is the symbols of a city. So I think an organizing principle around these multiple kind of books can be pretty cool. But Rebecca Solomon is one of my favorites. And Rebecca's awesome. Uh, I've not met her personally, but she's just awesome. Uh, and sorry, we're, we're again not wrapping. We're adding new material to the call. Uh, so what else did we do on this call? Uh, Klaus. Yeah, I'm, I'm coming back to uh, process and, and structure. And I would argue that looking at theory U, we are in the, in the stage of crystallizing. So when you when you follow up before crystallize, crystallizing is concepting. You know, and then from there, you go into prototyping. So we are getting closer to prototyping an idea. That sounds great. Thanks, Klaus. And, and, and it, I felt several juicy things we can do together go through this call um, and get reframed as we talked about them. So I'm, I'm excited about that. Jay? Um, so I'm trying to parallel the uh, conversation of decentralized, uh, decentralization trends, uh, localization trends, and the book idea that you're talking about and trying to wrap them into one, which is something about sophisticated uh, localization that has, uh, you know, so sophisticated network, excuse me, sophisticated net, highly networked localization, because then you can read the imprint from the local component or the front component, but front through that, almost like a, the way the internet's supposed to work, you can also connect to and support and be connected to those other parts. I like that expression of the idea a lot. Um, who else are uh, wrapping? Scott? Um, I'm just grateful for the opportunity to share where I have been um, and where I've landed. My crystal within the crystal, I think, because I agree with Klaus, I, I am crystallizing. And the response that I've gotten throughout all of this, being able to share that and then have you at the end say, oh, like Scott's little drawing or to have um, you know, someone else say, I'm so glad I jumped on this call because of this. Um, that was significant for me. And I hope that because of the comments that I heard, it was at least in some way significant for you and that you might be grateful that I'm continuing to progress based on these weekly calls. So. Thank you, Scott. And I love absorbing your systems thinking journey. Like, like when you check in with, with your progress and with the things that you're focused on, it, it, I, I'm, I'm like absorbing that and it makes me happy. So thank you for, for putting that in our conversation. That's really great. Anyone else? What else did we touch on this? Uh, Julian? This has been a pretty stimulating call. In fact, I would say the number of tags to follow up on just from this hour and a half is by far greater than the other calls. So this is uh, something I really appreciate. I'm the kind of person who just likes to suck things in and then the crystallization will come later. But man, there was so much material from today. Cool, thank you. And, and uh, we've been using the chat here, not the Mattermost. And uh, Pete, I don't know if copy pasting is gonna work, but that, that could be a way to get it, all of this into Mattermost easily. I find I don't have, I'm not using a big screen, I'm only using my laptop. So it's really hard for me to pay attention to Mattermost and see people's expressions, which I have to do because I'm busy watching for who want, who would like to contribute. So we got to solve for that somehow. But uh, but the, the chat's been really juicy as, 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 as often it is. I'm going to uh, just drop in, hop in, get works for chat and screen on an iPad. So uh, hop in.2? <clears throat> 
it, it, it's a platform like Zoom that yeah. hop in, you, you can see chat on an iPad. Yeah, but hop in is mostly a conference, an, an event platform, right? It's not a casual. Well, I mean, you know, so is Zoom, you know. <clears throat> hmm, interesting. Okay. Um, and by the way, there's a whole bunch of WebRTC, um, uh, more open WebRTC based Zoom alikes that we might co opt and plug in. And the Dig Life group has, has been using co op.me or something like that. Uh, they've been experimenting with what this looks like. So if we shifted our calls to a platform that allows us to plug in a better chat or open source things, that might be a really interesting path that might let us sort of customize what we're doing. Um, other final thoughts for over our time? Good, Ken, uh, you're muted, but you have the last word. Uh, speaking of shifting the calls, um, next Thursday is Christmas Eve. That might be important for some people. Good point. Um, and I noticed you originally said 7 a.m. because there were gonna be people from different time zones. It seems like mostly we have a few people from the West Coast, a bunch of people from the East Coast and some folks from Europe. So I'm wondering, Going into the new year, might we shift to eight o'clock? Um, it would be a little bit more humane for me anyway. I don't know about anybody else who doesn't like to get up really early, but um, you know, just uh, I thought I'd put that out there and see what the what the the, the group thinks. Um, thank you. And you've mentioned this before, and I've toyed with it myself, um, and it's probably a good idea. I kept it early because I love the idea that by the time eight thirty rolls around, we're done with a good deep long call. And I feel like I still have a day ahead because sort of eating more of the morning is going to be hard, but I totally get that 7 a.m. And the folks from Singapore and uh, Hong Kong have not shown up really much at all. So you're totally right. The, re the reason I, I, did, I did early hasn't really worked. Um, so let's- Even 7.30 would help. Yeah, yeah. Uh, for the practical issue of next week, shall we shift the call to Friday? Or Friday that, is Christmas. Does so. that break? Oh, Friday is Christmas Day. Screw that. <laughs> uh, no, good point. Okay. So shall we shall we skip next Thursday? What's the thought? I'm happy to be on the call. I'm trapped in lockdown, so I'm happy to be on the call too. <laughs> uh, I think what I can do is I can just say on the invite, and, and we did a Thanksgiving call, which was really great. Um, so why don't why don't we hold the call and people who need to celebrate with family and prepare just don't show up and. That sounds, that sounds groovy with me, but I'd love to be here because um, y'all are my peeps right now. And the time? Uh, for let's make it 8, 8 a.m. next week. Yes. And Thank that you. Could, that could start a trend. Who knows? And okay? the following Thursday is New Year's Eve. Exactly, exactly. Um, uh, well, New Year's Eve, less of a problem. I think we, we maybe still go ahead with things. Uh, I we'll have a champagne call. Yeah, New Year's Day probably more of a problem because no everybody be like looped and, and hung over or something. I don't know. Yeah, I guess we're not. Gonna, I guess night. we're not going to go out and party, right? Man. Okay. Um, thank you, everybody. This has been fabulous. Really appreciate you. And uh, see you next week at eight a.m. Pacific. Thanks, guys. Take care. Stay right. safe. Take care. Yeah. Bye. Bye.